Hello and welcome to Socialism, the Marxist podcast from the Socialist Party. Who was Friedrich Engels and what were his ideas? Marxism, originally called Scientific Socialism, takes its name from Karl Marx, but Marx didn't work alone in developing his ideas. His co-philosopher and close friend shares the credit for that historic work. How did these two giants of socialism come together? What led Engels to develop revolutionary ideas? What were his most important contributions to socialist thought? And what can we learn from his hands-on approach, not just to ideas, but in fighting to put them into practice? This episode of Socialism, part of a short series on Engels, introduces the co-founder of Marxism, the revolutionary life of Friedrich Engels. Listeners, we know you come to Socialism, the podcast, because you want to hear about ideas which can change the world. I'm going to give you some more of those ideas just now with this episode on the revolutionary life and ideas of Friedrich Engels. But first, let's have a little talk about ideas and how you can hear more about them. Because capitalism is in deep crisis. And as always, it's the working class who are expected to pay. Poverty preys on us all. Job losses abound. But revolt is in the air. Covid showed us we can't trust the bus class with our future. So the big question is, how can these movements become powerful enough to make the change that we need? Well, what if there was an online event discussing all the big issues facing working class and young people today? Current affairs, international events, history, theory and more. What if that event was attended by hundreds of socialists, trade unionists and working class fighters from across Britain and the world. What if you could take part in that event and join those discussions on these vital questions? Well, how could you afford to miss such a hypothetical event? Good news, it's not hypothetical, it's called Socialism 2020 and you can join in. So that's four days of discussion, debate and rallies from Friday the 20th to Monday the 23rd of November 2020. You can buy tickets for the whole event or just a day or even just one session if you can't get off work. Pricing is variable so you can come even if you've been cut back or laid off and you can read all about it and book your tickets at socialism2020.net. So come, hear more about our ideas, with plenty of opportunities to ask questions and have your own say. Come to Socialism 2020. Visit socialism2020.net now. So this month, on the 20th of November, is the bicentenary of the birth of Friedrich Engels, the great revolutionary leader and theoretician, and here to introduce us to a short series we're running on some of Engels' most important contributions to Marxist thinking is Lenny Shale from the Socialist Party National Committee. Hello, Lenny. Hi, James. How are you doing, mate? I'm pretty good, thanks. How are you? Good. Good. And we're going to start off with an overview of Engels' life. So, Lenny, let's start by asking, who was Friedrich Engels? Well, Friedrich Engels is a German man who was born, as you said, well, 200 years ago. In, so 1820. In, yeah, 1820 on 20th of November, who is often associated, even regarded amongst, not even socialists, often associated with Karl Marx, who's often renowned as one of the greatest theoreticians, greatest philosophers in history, really. He's often associated with his almost psychic, his assistant or a collaborator. And mm. he was, he was a collaborator. But Engels was a modest man and probably downplayed his own role, really, in his work alongside Marx in building some of the building blocks for the type of socialism that we know of today. And he was really a revolutionary thinker in his approach to what the working class was, the importance of the working class. But more than that, going into delving deep into the science of socialism, what we now know as Marxism, which carries Marx's name, but Engels played a massive role in that. But he wasn't just a philosopher, a theoretician or a journalist, which he's often called, oh, he's a fantastic journalist. But he was more than that. He was a class fighter. He placed himself at the standpoint of working people in that time. And some of his works that he produced then, they were written for the time to intervene in the movement then. But they've stood the test of time. They're still hugely relevant today. And I know the series we're going to be doing, I think, will go into even more detail on some of these fantastic and ever so relevant works. 
So I suppose that leads us on to the question, why is he so important for socialists? Well, Engels, even maybe before Marx, really identified that at the time, the working class was still in his infancy. The first factory had only been built in 1762, I think, is the first factory in Salford in northwest England. So factories, urbanisation... The working class as a class in itself was still in its early infancy and early stage. And Engels, through his work, which we'll go into, his experiences, realised that the working class was like no other class in history. And it had the power, it had the ability, if it knew it, to, in effect, transform society, to do away with capitalism, the horrors that were emerging in the world at that time as the Industrial Revolution developed. Two distinct classes had developed, the bourgeoisie, the ruling class, and the working class. And he really identified the working class was going to be this key force. But he also, alongside Marx, began to understand that some of the philosophies that actually brought them into politics and socialist ideas, like followers of Hegel, though these philosophers had really inspired them to get involved, that actually there were some mistakes of their approach. And they, in their own words, turned them on their head. Mm from an idealist perspective to a materialist perspective, which we'll go into. But more than that, he delved into a whole load of issues from women and the role of how capitalism developed in the oppression of women, the role of science, mathematics. He delved into a whole host of things, a real amazing character, really, and an amazing class fighter. So you mentioned earlier that Engels is seen as a collaborator of Karl Marx, although you've also said he underplays his own role in helping to develop the ideas of scientific socialism. He was a brilliant thinker in his own right. But what then exactly was his relationship to Karl Marx? Was it purely academic or purely professional? How did they come across each other? What happened? Well, they first came across each other. They both knocked about in a group in their 20s called the Young Hegelians in Berlin. And it was a group that sort of brought together all the sort of radical things at the time. You've got to picture this is in the sort of only a few decades after the French Revolution. Mm-hmm. Which is when Hegel himself developed yeah, his ideas. exactly. So radical thinking, the idea of rational thought. They are both born, I mean, Engels was born into a very almost evangelicist Christian upbringing. I mean, Marx was slightly different. His family were originally Jewish, but his dad had to convert to Christianity for work reasons. He was a lawyer. So they both, they wanted to approach things with like, the idea of rational thought. I mean, the first time they met each other, they almost had a bit of disdain for each other. Marx didn't really trust Engels. He thought he was a typical bourgeois that a lot of the young Hegelians were like. But the second time they met, they realised that actually both of them had really began to form the same ideas and concepts, really actually of almost taking Hegelism and turning it on its head, which we'll go into later in relation to dialectics. But they were more than that. They were great friends, they were collaborators, and really they spent their lives dedicated to each other, helping each other build an organisation for the working class. That was their goal. Yeah, so they spent the rest of their lives, really, after their second meeting in 1844 as collaborators, as friends, as political comrades. And that was a unique and historic relationship, really. And Engels, to some extent, as Marx's bankroll when he ran into financial troubles as well. Yes, and also that. But that was, again, I think it's often overstated, I think. Engels was in a position where he could work in his dad's company as a manager in the factory, which helped fund their revolutionary activity. They had no other funds. Mm. And Engels chose that. And he didn't choose it because it meant he had more money. I mean, he often talked about the best day of his life was the day he could stop working in the factory and become Mm. a full-time revolutionary. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you mentioned that when Marx and Engels first came across each other in the young Hegelians, fighting against the ideas of the old Hegelians, that Marx had a certain amount of contempt for Engels, that he saw him as a typical bourgeois. So what do you mean by that? What was Engels' background? You mentioned he worked for his dad's company, which owned factories. Yeah, so, I mean, Engels was born in an area of northwest Germany called Wuppertal. Well, it's now called Wuppertal. It's often towns and that sort of join up. And his family were very wealthy. They were strict Christians. They owned cotton mills, both in Germany, but also in Salford, just outside Manchester. And, I mean, even as a teenager, he rejected what he saw as oppressive religion. He rejected the sort of bourgeois lifestyle he was being groomed into. Mm. As an older teenager, he was sent to the sort of industrial areas around places called Eberfeld and Bremen. And he there, it's in, it's in Germany still. And he was there to be trained as a sort of young like clerk to get into the family business. But while he was there, he witnessed really the horrors of the industrial revolution. He began to see the poverty-stricken workers, the lives they lived, both in the factory but also in their private lives, and really the disdain he had. For the ruling class, he saw Which how he himself come from. He, yeah, and he saw how these so-called religious people had. I'll read out a quote 
because I think it's fantastic because it also shows the great way Engels often put things across by an element of humour about something so horrific. Mm. This is just one of his early... He's almost 19 years old at this point. He talks about the conditions. He says, Terrible poverty prevails among the lower classes, particularly the factory workers in Wuppertal. Syphilis and lung diseases are so widespread as to be barely credible. In Eberfeld alone, out of... 2,500 children of school age, 1,200 are pride of education and grow up in the factories, merely so the manufacturer need not pay the adults whose place they take twice the wage he pays a child. But the wealthy manufacturers have a flexible conscience and causing the death of one child, more or one less, does not doom a pietist's soul to hell, especially if he goes to church twice every Sunday. And I think there he sort of, he sums up that on the one hand you have these people that claim to be religious, caring, and then quite happy to uh, allow children to be killed in their factories. And I think it's horrific, really. But that's what began to radicalise this young Engels. So it's this hypocrisy and the experience of the actual conditions of the working class. Yeah, exactly. And he, later on, he had to serve military service. This is, I remember this is before what we know as Germany today, in the Kingdom of Prussia. And so he was sent to do his military service in Berlin. This is where he began to knock about with this group we talked about a minute ago, Jung Hegelians, and so was Karl Marx. So they, they never actually met at this point. They didn't meet actually until 1842. Mm-hmm. But they knew each other in the same circles. Mm-hmm. Engels was writing almost reports of what he was seeing in this area. Mm-hmm. And Marx was sort of editor of a newspaper that these young radicals that began to produce it. So that was the Neue Rheinische Zeitung, yeah, the New Rheinische Times. That, that, that so, one, yes. And actually, Marx, at this point, still thought Engels was this sort of young, petty bourgeois, that he might be a good journalist, but really he wasn't seeing what the real processes that were taking place, that Marx was beginning to see. Mm-hmm. But Marx was later proven wrong, really, and admitted quite mitly that the second time he met Engels. This was after he'd read Engels' first book, wasn't it, I think? Yes, his first book, The Condition of the Working Class in England. Right, so hang on. How the hell did he end up in England? Well, as I mentioned earlier, Engels' father owned the factory in Salford, was joint owner of a company there. And so when Engels was in his early 20s, he was sent over to work in the factory as a clerk. Obviously, he worked first of all as a clerk, later on as a manager in, in this factory, but every minute of every day he could, when he wasn't at work... Engels threw himself into the world around him. Not the bourgeois, upper-class world he was meant to live in. He spent all of his time in the poorest areas of Solf at this point. And it's quite hard, I think, to describe just how the slums, the squalor... I mean, read Engels' book, and I know we're going to have a podcast specifically on this publication. Mm-hmm. And I think it's worth... Maybe, he's 24 when he published this book, and I still... This even in 1845. 1845. Originally, it was a collection of all the articles he'd produced. Mm-hmm. So he was published when he was 25. And even today, you read it, and it's horrific. We'll go on to later. Many of the conditions are probably still in existence today. So this is interesting, because often Marxism in general, but also specifically that work, the condition of the working class in England, is dismissed by opponents of socialism as, oh, well, you know, that was all very well for 19th century factory conditions, but it doesn't apply anymore. But well, you think it does? I think it does. You go to parts of Southeast Asia, the garment factories, parts of South America. Ch- well, who knows what some of the conditions going on in China. I th- and there are still sweatshops in Leicester. In the oh, exactly. What we've seen with the COVID crisis, how it's exposed the conditions. Many poor people often work illegally for legal wages. This is what Engels saw when he arrived in Salford and Manchester. Mm. But again, I touched on earlier that often he's called a journalist. And I think it's almost offensive to call him that because he didn't go as an observer to report for the sake of it. Mm. He did it to see what was going on. Again, as I said earlier, the working class was in infancy. This urbanisation, the bringing together of all these people from all different parts of the country, many of them are Irish in Manchester, Mm. and living in absolutely horrific conditions. But Engels went there to see what was going on, to experience firsthand what was going on, but also to understand and develop a message and a programme to take from it, because he wanted to change society. I think it's important, because this sums up Engel's approach. He didn't go as an observer from the outside, he went in to be with those people. Mm -hmm. And it sums it up by this, he said, look, I wanted more than a mere abstract knowledge of my subject. I wanted to see you in your own homes, to observe you in your everyday life, to chat with you on your condition and grievances, to witness your struggles against the social and political power of your oppressors. I have done so. I forsake the company and the dinner parties, the port wine and champagne of the middle classes, and devoted my leisure hours almost exclusively to the intercourse with the plain working men. I am both glad and proud of having done so. And again, I'll just quickly, when he talks about working men, he means 
working men and women. It's right. more of an element of the language at the time. Mm. And he did that. And this is the preface, once he published it, it's a declaration to the working classes of Great Britain. He really wants to show his appreciation that they'd helped him understand what the working class was and its potential power. Mm. And just to throw in, I mean, he was helped along the way by a woman he met while he was doing these sort of investigations by a woman called Mary Burns, an Irish labourer in one of his father's factories, actually, who was a fiery character, uh, had helped lead some of the protests in her own dad's factory. Mm. And Engels was inspired by her and they became life partners. They never married, but Engels rejected not just the lifestyle, he rejected all the norms of the bourgeois lifestyle was meant to provide and he was meant to live by. So he lived with Mary for the rest of his life. They were comrades, collaborators. She helped out with a lot of his work. And he learned so much from her. And she helped introduce him into the working class of Manchester and Salford. All right, so that's what he got up to when he was sent to the northwest of England, to Salford and Manchester, to work as a manager in his father's factories. You've talked a little bit about the effect that experience had on him. Is there anything more you'd like to say on that? Well, not only did it inspire him to dedicate even more so of his life to the struggle for the proletariat, for the working class, he was seeing these horrendous conditions, but his time in Germany, his time in Manchester, uh, mixed with his... He was a theoretician, he was an extremely clever person who had read a lot of Hegel's stuff. It's in the aftermath of the French Revolution, there's all these sort of writers, and many of them were idealist. Mm. And when we say idealist thinkers... We're talking about people that, like Hegel himself, although he talked about dialectics, not to go into loads of detail about this, and we've got a really good podcast about it. Yeah, the one on socialism, utopian and scientific. (laughs) Exactly, it is a really good podcast. But Hegel brought about this concept, or I suppose he found the dialectic. And dialectic simply, I think, is the best way to look at it, is it's a way of looking at things from an all-sided manner, that it's almost everything has contradictions. Things are good and bad, not just good or bad. Mm. And you look through life, events, struggles, there's all sorts of contradictions. I mean, biggest contradiction within capitalism today, we have huge abundance of wealth, greater understanding in science and technology, yet people who are working harder, paid less, and all of that science and technology is used to exploit people more. It's a Mm. huge contradiction. But that's it in just short. But Engels, through his living experience... And at the same time, Marx was drawing these same conclusions. They realised that the problem with Hegel's approach to dialectics was he approached it with an idealist approach, that he was still religious, really. Mm. And he thought that the events, developments in the world, this urbanisation, the Industrial Revolution, that was being brought about by ideas, Mm -hmm. rather than events, struggles, the economy... Nature. Nature being the driving force that produced ideas. So, So hang on, so the position of idealism is that there are these sort of concepts which exist outside reality almost, which like, like come like, in and like, shape yeah, it. Like religion. Like right, OK. Religion produces the world almost. Yeah, like, sure. And that's something which is abstract, which exists outside what we materially experience. But materialism, the opposite of idealism, that says the real world and things in it provoke ideas in us, which we can then in turn turn back on the world. Exactly. That through our experiences, Engels' experiences, I mean, an idealist approach would be, well, Engels is born into a rich family surely he would have just enjoyed being in a rich family the rest of his life. Mm. But Engels' experiences of seeing the horrors of the Industrial Revolution, seeing the horrors of capitalism in his infancy and, and its effect on working class drove him towards radical ideas to want to change the world. And in their own words, they turned the dialectic on its head. Mm-hmm. So they took Hegel's dialectical thinking but took it to a materialist concept. So and, rather than it being a conflict between different ideas driving things forward... It was a conflict of different forces in the real world. Exactly. Which drove forward. And the conflicts of these forces in this scenario was this development of the working class and the development of the bourgeoisie, the ruling class. And you had almost the vision of how then the socialists at the time would approach questions. Mm. The idealists that Engels and Marx were beginning now to come into conflict with approached things with, oh, we need to appeal for reason. If only we were kinder. Like Robert Owen, the radical thinker of his time, mm-hmm. yeah, I remember uh, it was talked about in one of the previous podcasts about how he wrote her a letter appealing to Queen Victoria to yeah. be nicer to the working people. <laughs> so there's a concept that if you just appeal to the ruling class, they might be nicer to us. Whereas mm. Marx and Engels realised, and no, the working class it was an independent force. That only the working class as a class in itself, for itself, had the ability to change its own conditions and change society. Because um, why would the ruling class... Right, give up power and prestige for the sake of ideas. 
<laughs> exactly. And that's what drove them. And some of their early arguments are almost as ridiculous as that. Yeah, and so both of them realised the second time they met in 1844 in Paris, mm -hmm. as Engels was returning for the second time go back to England, they met up in a bar and they realised, bloody hell, both of us are thinking the same way. Mm -hmm. We're turning a dialectic on its head and we're beginning to understand the historic role of the working class will play in transforming society. This is what brought them together. Yeah. yeah that they realised they were heading in the same direction. That they'd seen something of what the working class actually lived through and experienced Engels, I think, probably more than Marx. Yeah, it was after Marx read the conditions of the English working class that Marx realised this guy's onto something. And mm. Marx was approaching the question with this theoretical approach, but it was Engels' analysis and understanding of the working class that Marx realised that this was the force that could change society. So it was a combination of that and their experience of the religious hypocrisy of the ruling class and the effect which that had on their ideas around Hegel's sort of quasi-religious or yeah. fully religious idealist dialectics. This brought them to this idea of materialist dialectics, as you said. So was this analysis to philosophy, to thinking about the world, this approach of materialist dialectics, was this popular at the time? Not at all, actually. <laughs> um, and again, that's another thing I think it's really important. You have to put things in the context that these are two men who knocked about in what were already quite small circles. Mm. There was a lots of radical thinkers. And really, for most of their lives, they were a minority. But they didn't just want to be minority. They sought out arguments and battles, not for the sake of it. They knew and realised that, and it's a famous quote, philosophers hitherto have interpreted the world, our task is to change it. Mm, and they on Feuerbach. Yeah, exactly. And they realised that they had the ideas that could transform and change the world. Mm. And they wanted to go out there and disprove these other theories. And I spent a lot of time doing that very sharply and boldly. But this was only because they wanted to make sure that an actual working strategy was presented. Exactly. And, and they weren't prepared to compromise. I mean, there's some fantastic stories. Often historians lambast them for always arguing, being really aggressive. But they were aggressive for a reason, because you read Engels' book and you see the poverty, the horrors that he'd witnessed. Mm. He wanted to do something about that. So he wasn't prepared to compromise on that. And these other ideas, which today could almost be really laughed at. And actually, a lot of Engels' is this dialectical, materialist approach is often sometimes unconsciously used today. I mean, some of the articles about the American presidential election just last week almost makes a look a joke about that it's good old-fashioned economics that has been the driving force behind <laughs> the vote. And that's Engels' dialectical materialist approach, mm. Marx and Engels' approach, which really today is almost commonly accepted. Yeah, although of course we should caution that the capitalist thinkers <laughs> yeah. actually do not yeah. apply a dialectical materialist approach, but like you say, unconsciously land on elements of yeah. it from time yeah, exactly, to time. Exactly. So, look, there's quite a lot of high theory that we've gone through here and that meant a lot of time spent in discussion. And there is a kind of popular image of Marx and Engels drinking themselves into a stupor in bars and getting thrown out onto the streets by publicans or spending all their time in the British Library looking up Adam Smith and, you know, reports of the Bank of England and this sort of thing. Do they just spend their whole time in libraries and bars discussing theory like a lot of historians like to portray? Well, they did do a lot of that, but not at all. Again, I think it's a really important thing that Engels and Marx weren't just two guys that sat in the British Library writing books. They wrote books. Remember, this is in their whole lives, but they actually really, their day-to-day -day work and activity was dedicated to the struggles of the time. Mm -hmm. And most of their material, we know the main titles, the main documents, books that they produced, but they produced way more. And they were agitational. They were often dealing with events and developments that they took place. And they realised that they didn't just want to be two guys writing about the world. They wanted to build an organisation around them. They set about themselves that task. They threw themselves in any way to try and build a movement, and a, an organisation, a party for the working class. And they dedicated their lives to that fundamentally. Most of their life was dedicated to building an organisation for the working class. And so for a lot of the 1840s, after their second meeting where they realised they got along like a house on fire, both politically and socially, they spent most of their 1840s both honing their understanding of what was taking place. I mean, Marx at this point wrote The Holy Family, some other sort of quite held up documents and books at the time which Engels assisted in. But they also threw themselves into try and build an organisation around them, mm -hmm. a revolutionary party, and they knocked about with certain communist groups in Germany and also a group called The League of the Just, which was a sort of... It was in England. Yeah, in England. And it had members in parts of Europe and was really, it come from that sort of semi-Christian, idealist background, 
The one is just appeal to reason, kindness and justice. And actually, Marx and Engels joined it to try and win some of the good layers that might have illusions within it at the time and win people to the idea that we need to get organised. And that, again, it's another thing, because they were prepared to argue their case. They never hid from debate, and they didn't have a sort of approach of, I know best. Mm. They wanted to win people to their ideas, fundamentally. To convince them and help develop their yeah, political exactly, understanding yeah. rather than just telling them what to do. Exactly. And I think you see that with Engels' approach in, in Mansfield and Manchester. They never had a top-down approach. They wanted to bring people with them along their struggle. And in 1847, you saw the creation of the Communist League, in effect, forcing the League of the Just to change its name, and one of the communist groups in Germany joined as well, and where they began to take on a course away from the idealism of its past and towards a materialist approach. I mean, it's a simple thing, but one of the first things they did was change the motto from all men are equal, because Engels made the point, well... All men aren't equal because there's <laughs> proletarians and there's bourgeois. Yeah. And so their motto became working men of all countries unite. And again, mm. it means men and women in the language of its time. Mm-hmm. So they changed the motto and they wanted to help it become a revolutionary organisation. And again, it wasn't just an organisation just sat and talked about. At its second congress in November, December 1847, which actually took place just off Soho in London... It's uh, all bar one now, actually. <laughs> if you ever want to go down there, it's a good place to go and check out. Purely for political reasons, of course. Marx and Engels were set the task to form a document, like a list of guidelines, a manifesto mm-hmm. for this league, which would become the Communist Manifesto that we know today. So they were tasked with writing a manifesto for this new Communist League. Yeah, and so they went away. And again, the Communist Manifesto, I think, is one of the most widely read, known books, documents in the world. Mm. It's historic. It stood the test of time as well. You read it, and who can't be enthralled by the way of writing, the topics they touch on, and how it inspires the idea of fighting for a better world. But it was a document, really. It was written for its time. It was written to help the socialists who were moved away from the idealism of the past, Mm -hmm. well, more of them were moving away, to intervene in the struggles at the time. So when you say it was made for its time, you don't mean that it's out of date. You mean rather that it was a practical document, a guide to action. Yeah, I mean, it's more because of how they understood the processes taking place, that it stood the test of time. But Marx and Engels didn't write it thinking, oh, I hope this is going to be good in 200 years' time. (laughs) (laughs) They wrote it. um, Won't it be good now? Yeah, won't it be good now? It was about helping intervene in the struggles taking place. And And guide a successful revolution. Exactly. They didn't want to wait. They understood that capitalism is infancy, but they still, this working class, it needed to have a set of ideas and a manifesto and a programme that was vital to arm the working class to change society. And the irony is, in 1848, when it was eventually published, the revolutionary wave just spread across Europe. Good Uh, timing? Yeah, it was fantastic timing. And again, it demonstrates that they realised that this was vital. And that's why they were so determined to help form the Communist League, despite its small forces at first, because they knew that these events were coming because of the processes that were taking place. So the Communist Manifesto comes out at this very opportune time. And that's not a mistake, by the way. Of course, (laughs) you know, Marx and Engels would have been watching events and they would have understood that there was something in the air there that they needed to try and pull these forces together at this moment in history, as well as for the longer haul. And the Communist Manifesto, by the way, for those of you who haven't read it, as well as being a fantastic document for intervening in struggle in the 19th century, the ideas which it explains, you know, the incredible density of ideas, and they're so clear. And actually, the more that you come to understand about Marxism, the more that you see how complex it is, this short document, which just brings up all these basic ideas. It's an absolutely brilliant text, which is a must-read for any socialist and something to go back to again and again. But having written this manifesto for the Communist League, revolutions break out, like you say, all across Europe in 1848. Now, did Marx and Engels just sit back and go, we'll leave things to it? What did they do? Again, it's another thing so often forgotten. As soon as it's kicked off, they went back to Germany because it was a revolutionary wave. I mean, large parts of Europe still hadn't really gone through a bourgeois revolution, a capitalist revolution in the sense that feudal landlords, the old monarchies still controlled. I mean, Germany was, I can't remember the exact figure, but many different small states with different kings and princes. Mm. And really, this revolutionary wave... It was really led by a section of what's like the liberal emerging capitalist class. Mm-hmm. They were fighting for democratic demands, really, for the ideas of like parliamentary democracy, removal of the monarchy, against this old feudal backward order. And they threw themselves in it. Now, and also, of course, for the removing of all these internal barriers within what became Germany so they could have a bigger market to sell their exactly. goods and exploit labour. Exactly, yeah. And so that was their limitations. Mm. And the Max Engels realised this, but they nevertheless 
And again, this is important for socialists today, but we throw ourselves into movements that aren't sometimes purely socialist, but they're still a step forward for working people. So Marx and Engels tactically and critically supported these revolutionary movements. They went to Cologne, they set up a newspaper, again, because they wanted to get their ideas out there, and it was called the Organ for Democracy, Mm -hmm. to fight against the monarchist forces, like the Prussian monarchy. But though they fought alongside these sort of liberal bourgeois types, (laughs) they didn't hide back their criticisms of them. They were massively critical. They never stopped criticising their disdain, their distrust. And making it clear, these people would eventually sell out the peasantry and these beginnings of the working class, the, the masses, if you like, had thrown themselves into this revolutionary wave. And again, though they helped form this paper, it helped, I mean, some of it's on the internet, is just article after article, they're writing daily on the events taking place in different parts of Germany. And Engels himself threw himself, not just in reporting or corresponding or writing about the events, he fought, he fought on the front line, commanded troops, I mean, he had a nickname after called The General. Mm. I mean, he used his experience in doing military service to be a fearsome fighter. But again, though he fought on the front line alongside some of who he'd be happily criticising, yeah, he didn't stop his criticisms. These, in his eyes, bourgeois forces that... Although presumably most of the capitalist forces yeah. were not actually on the front line. No, exactly. <laughs> and so he had this disdain that... They were too quick to compromise with mm. the monarchists, and that would eventually, it did, it lent to the defeat of this revolutionary wave. I think it's a funny story, but I think just to show how much <laughs> he demonstrated his disdain and hatred to these bourgeois people that were at the head of the movement, that at one point he was actually arrested by the revolutionary insurgents because they were like, how can this guy be fighting with us if he hates us so much? <laughs> So they arrested him, and eventually... And this was the capitalist leadership in the movement, yeah, not yeah, the actual yeah, ranks. No, no, yeah, no. <laughs> they arrested him. I think mean, it's similar to what took place in France, the French Revolution, the British Revolution, where you saw Cromwell go back against some of the more radical forces that helped provide the backbone to that movement. So they arrested him. I mean, eventually let him go, and he joined up with other sort of communist, socialist fighters as well. But as Marx and Engels predicted, and I, I mean, I'd go back and if people are interested, read some of the reports, they're fantastic. I mean, sometimes it's funny, they're just disdain for these people. Mm. But the movement was defeated. And Engels was lucky to have his life saved, really. He was able to escape through Switzerland. As the movement defeated, Marx had to flee as well. And they both returned to England. I mean, just to highlight, this is their final sort of declaration from the editorial board of Organ of Democracy from Cologne. And they sort of sign it off, like, finally we warn you against any push in Cologne. In a military situation, obtaining Cologne, you'll be irretrievably lost. You have seen in Eberfeld that the bourgeoisie sends the workers into the fire and betrays them afterwards in the most infamous way. A state of siege in Cologne would demoralise the entire Rhine province. The Prussians will be frustrated by your calmness. In bidding you farewell, the editors of... Do you want to pronounce that? Neue Rheinische Zeitung. Thank you for the sympathy you have shown us. Their last word everywhere and always will be. Emancipation of the working class. So this is interesting because you said, you know, Marx and Engels here were fighting alongside... The capitalist class, which at this time in history was a revolutionary class. Today, it's an out-and-out reactionary class. And today, we would absolutely oppose fighting alongside capitalists in that way. So that's an important difference, isn't it? Because, of course, this is a time in the 19th century before capitalism has established itself as the dominant global system. That only happens once. Exactly, yeah. But even then, even when they were fighting to wipe out feudalism, which in this day and age, remnants still exist, but <laughs> yeah. it's been subordinated to this global capitalist system, even then, they were completely, just 100% opposed, really, to the capitalists and the regime that they were about to bring in, but supported it to wipe out feudalism, but said to the working class, these people, you know, don't trust them. It seems like an incredible position to take. And that's the beauty of dialectics, really, because they understood that things have a dual character, there is a contradiction in things. And Marx and Engels, despite their disdain for capitalism, they still understood that for a period in history, capitalism was a revolutionary force. It helped bring society from the backwardness, the horrors of feudalism, and for its time was a progressive force. Mm -hmm. Even today, look, we see some of the benefits of that. But it's not to say that we then support the processes that brought it into, the horrors of slavery or the horrors of the Industrial Revolution, but they recognised the role it played but they also recognised that the independent role of the working class, that only the working class could then take it further forward. And it really provided some of the backbone to some of the ideas and concepts that Lenin and Trotsky then used in the Russian Revolution, that recognising mm. that despite the backwardness, the peasant-dominated country that Russia was in 1917, that despite that, 
only the working class. You couldn't trust the capitalist class to carry out even a democratic revolution. Only the working class could. And that's what they were fighting for in 1848. So Lenin and Trotsky in the Russian Revolution said to the workers, the capitalists are going to sell you out, therefore don't stop, carry on, keep going. And in 1848, Marx and Engels were saying the same thing to a much smaller, much weaker working Exactly, class. And, and really, it would be fantastic to hear what they thought at the time, whether they thought it could have been successful. But despite that, and it, they were a small minority, but they still thought it was important, because even by getting involved, they could win people over. And again, I don't want to spend too long on it, but again, just to show that these two guys, they weren't just theoreticians, You read the report to the Communist League because they wouldn't go out there as individuals. They went out there to build an Mm organisation. And you see the address to the Central Committee to the Communist League in London in 1850. So they both come back to England now. Engels has managed to escape. This is after the defeat of the revolution. Exactly. And it's like a report, almost like a party building report or like how well have we done to build the Communist League? Mm -hmm. So they talk about in two revolutionary years of 1848 to 49, the League proved itself in two ways. First, its members everywhere involved themselves energetically in the movement and stood in the front ranks of only a decisively revolutionary class, the proletariat. In the press, on the barricades and on the battlefields, the League further proved itself in that its understanding of the movement, as expressed in the circulars issued by the Congresses and the Central Committee of 1847, and in the manifesto of the Communist Party, has been shown to be the correct one. And they go on, they talk about some of the gains they made, some of the losses. These are dealing with the practicalities of building a revolutionary force and using any opportunity to put their programme out there. And that's what they did. They weren't just these sort of drunken idiots that got drunk and wrote about theory and that. They were fighters and they threw themselves any movement possible to do that. Some of the academics who base themselves or so they think on the ideas of Marx and Engels, who really just want to sit in pubs and libraries, ought to take note. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, yeah, exactly, exactly. So Engels is back in England. What did he and Marx get up to then? Well, clearly his movements ebb and flow. And the period after Engels was forced really to go back to work in his father's factory, he became a manager in that factory. And again, I think often historians like to portray how Engels is a factory owner. Well, he wasn't a factory owner. He worked as a manager in his father's firm and... It's worth making a point, I think I think I might mention earlier, he hated every day and every minute of it. He wanted to be a full-time revolutionary, but he had great admiration for Karl Marx. As I said before, he often downplayed his own role, probably didn't think of himself enough, really, as the amazing theoretician and thinker he was. So he actually worked for another 20 years until 1869 in his father's factory, funding both his own life and funding Marx mm. and Marx's family as well, because he had that trust. He had that both as a friend, but as also a comrade. It was down to him to finance the work that him and Marx were doing. And in that 20 years, again, they didn't just go back to the libraries and the bars. They did a lot of that. I mean, in that time, Marx reduced Capital Volume 1, which I think Engels summed up as... As long as capitalists and workers have existed in the world, no single book that could have had such importance for workers has appeared. And that was produced in 1867, and really it was down to Engels' funding of Marx to be able to spend the time delving into the British Library, really getting to grips with capitalism and everything about it. So they continue to collaborate theoretically, developing and honing further these ideas and concepts that they'd sort of began to grapple with earlier. But again, they didn't stop their struggle to build a party. They spent the rest of their lives trying to build an independent working class party in Britain, in other parts of Europe as well. In 1864, they helped build the International Working Men's Association, which is what we know as the first international. So Um, that was a world revolutionary party. Exactly, yeah. So they fought to bring that together. Now that included all sorts and ends. It included anarchists that were gathered around a guy called Bakunin, Included, probably included some idealists, but they still wanted to win people over. They were prepared to bring the best fighters together to win them over. And again, I think it's worth making a point, despite their desire and determination to build a party for the working class, they were also determined to make sure it had to have the correct programme. The programme was key, mm. and there couldn't be any compromises on analysis, understanding, ideas and, and programme. And it meant they had a lot of collisions with Bakunin. In 1871, you had the Paris Commune, and they did loads of work in so this, Britain. So this was a revolutionary insurrection in Paris. Exactly, a, a historic event, loads of lessons for socialists and Marxists. And Marx and Engels commented from afar, they helped build support from abroad, and actually even afterwards they helped the fleeing communards get, give them asylum in London, they helped support that. But in the sort of aftermath of that, there was big collisions with the anarchists over the role of the state and really issues that had always been there. I mean, Engels calls them 
anti-authoritarians in a lot of his writings who had no grasp of the role of the state and the role of what work of state would be and really a process of organisation he called them sort of petty bourgeois because again unlike Engels and Marx they didn't understand the independent role of the working class the role of how the capitalist state operates and is used and also the role of trade unions and other stuff some of his writings on that are fantastic yeah in fact Engels I remember at one point derides the anarchists by saying have these gentlemen ever seen a revolution it is the most authoritarian thing imaginable which of course doesn't mean what the right wing detractors of socialism imagine it doesn't mean some kind of individual totalitarian dictatorship what it means is a forceful abolition of the old order, in particular the organised violence of the old order, the capitalist state, which means that you have to organise self-defence. Yeah. I mean, that quote you just raised, I think, is fantastic because it has so many lessons. You could see how Lenin and Trotsky realised that in 1917. You need to defend the revolution. And even for the lessons for today, we see how the role of the capitalist state, and Engels sort of sums it up in the quote you just raised, Sadly, it ended up in the breakdown of the First International in 1876, but they didn't stop them. They just realised, look, this organisation, there's no point in it anymore, because we're just, if Bakunin's, despite the experience of the Paris Commune, if he still thinks all this, we've got to start again. Mm. And they were prepared to do that. They were prepared to walk out organisations. For them, programme was still key. Mm. Theory, programme, method were key to them. And only through that could they build a genuine party for the working class, and they dedicated their lives to that. And, uh, you know, they'd seen a couple of major failed revolutionary movements. How can you live through that and not think, well, we've got to get the ideas and the policies correct? Yeah, exactly. But, again, it didn't stop them. They helped build, really, some of the predecessor organisations that went on to form the Labour Party. And in particularly in Germany, Engels really helped nurture the early development of the German Social Democratic Party that went from a tiny organisation to a party that by the turn of the century had a huge number of MPs, deputies in the German parliament, Mm. a huge base amongst the huge German working class. And so they still dedicated their lives to that. And Engels helped as well the development of the Second International as well. So this is how he spent a lot of the later part of his life, wasn't it? Attempting to build a new mass party of socialist revolution worldwide, the Second International. Yeah, exactly. They saw that was still, despite their work on theory, despite honing their understanding... Despite, and I'll mention it later on, about their spending the time to produce more works and books, they still dedicated themselves to struggle, the struggle of organising the working class. They wrote lots on like the role of the trade unions. It's a small quote, but I think it's fantastic. To I think it provides inspiration for people in Britain today about the struggles for working people. He says, look, the unions are unexcelled. In them is developed the peculiar courage of the English. It is said on the continent that the English, and especially the working men, are cowardly, that they cannot carry out a revolution, because unlike the French, they do not riot at intervals, because they apparently accept the bourgeois regime so quietly. This is a complete mistake. The English working men are second to none in courage. They are quite restless as the French, but they fight differently. Uh, Again, I just think it's fantastic. (laughs) You often so hear, uh, why aren't we more like the French? Well, I think Engels, Engels experienced fighting of all sorts of people in Europe. And I think it's fantastic. It inspires you to think, actually, you know, we can have a socialist revolution in Britain. Yeah, and in fact, we have other episodes looking at the revolutionary history of Britain's working class. So Peterloo, for example, we've got one planned possibly later this year on the Chartist movement, which included revolutionary insurrections in Britain. We've got a podcast episode on the revolutionary upheavals in Britain after the First World War, and also one on the 1926 General Strike, which almost brought down the government. So there's plenty of history, both before and after Engels and Marx were thinking about these things, to demonstrate that Britain's working class is and can be revolutionary. Now, you've mentioned... A whole number of times, and it's a recurrent theme for the Committee for a Workers' International and for the Socialist Party, the independent role of the working class, the need for a working class party, and so on. And this report to the Communist League in 1850, where Marx and Engels explain that the working class, even in 1848, when it was these capitalist democratic revolutions take place, the working class was the only consistently revolutionary class. What does all this mean? Why is the working class the only consistently revolutionary class, even back then? Why does it have to have this independent role? Why does it need its own part? Again, I think it relates to the points you raised earlier, that Marx and Engels realised, as I think you raised, that the bourgeois would never give up their gains. They'd benefited from their own bourgeois capitalist revolutions. They had taken society forward, but only forward to a certain extent. Mm. Capitalism had so many contradictions that despite its huge leaps forward in understanding, in rational thinking, in technology, 
factories and so on. It was a fetter on its own development that its exploitation of the working class produced its own grave diggers. And that's an interesting point, isn't it? Because in 1848, when the capitalists were actually vying for power against the old feudal aristocracy, was that what they were afraid of? Is that why they weren't consistently revolutionary? Exactly, because they feared the movement, the type of people that it would create, that could eventually kick them out, change society, the working class. And so they ran into the arms of the monarchy, but even despite themselves, they ended up being in charge yeah. of the world capitalist um, system. And Marx and Engels understood, they were the first to understand that so the working class could not trust the bourgeois to give them anything, really, and it was down to the working class to fight. Any gain had to be fought for, mm. any gain, even under capitalism, had to be organised and struggled for, and ultimately to find the goal of socialism... You couldn't appeal to the capitalist class. They might grant series of reforms or throw us a few crumbs, but I think lots of our other podcasts touch on this. But only the working class as a force in itself could be trusted to fight for the sort of change that they wanted. But to do that, it couldn't just be like disorganised and hope of rebellion or hope of protest. Mm. Often Max Engels talked about objective factors, events, struggles, economic crisis, being factors in emerging events, struggles, protests, strikes. But also there's a subjective factor Mm -hmm. that socialists could play a role in helping bring together, organise, educate, provide a programme to arm the working class to take on the capitalist class and fight for a socialist change in society. But to do that, it had to have its own party, its Mm -hmm. own political armour, if you like, and weapon to fight for this. So the later part of Engels' life wasn't purely devoted to practical tasks of building. Those are not independent and separate from theoretical questions, which he'd worked on his whole life as well. So alongside building the Second International, in particular the Social Democratic Party, Germany, were there other big ideas or key texts or works which he produced in this time or that he collaborated with Marx on? Well, happily for Engels, as I mentioned earlier, he was able to sort of retire from factory work in 1869. He was able to then carry on funding his work and Marx's work. And again, he just sort of carried on, we mentioned earlier, the work he did in formation of the Second International, commenting on events and struggles taking place. But he also really brought together and honed and went even further in his understanding and writings on what often is labelled Marx but scientific socialism, Mm -hmm. going further into materialist understanding and analysis. In 1878, he produced a masterpiece, really, called Mm Anti-During, which has really sort of delved into how dialectics, mathematics, and its relation to sort of natural phenomena and natural developments in humanity. And in 1880... And this was a response, wasn't it, by the way, Anti-During to a kind of German professor yeah. who thought, oh, all this Marxism, it's all, you know, it's a bit too working class, it's a bit too messy for me, I've got this lovely idea about how we can do it much more simply. Yeah, and that's the beauty of Marx and Engels, that despite, I mean, I've spent most of the podcast trying to demonstrate how they were classified as freedoms, they were also prepared to have it out with any sort of professor or theoretician that their challenge well, really, their ideas and, and their... If there was a risk, it would infect the working class movement and send it down the wrong path. Exactly, I think that's really important because they understood that particularly in this time, the ideas were crucial and it was important. But again, I think they also realised it was important not just then, and even more important now. You read some of these key texts and it's still so relevant even today in terms of what's going on. And later on, I mean, three of the chapters of Manti During were sort of reworded, made more accessible, put together into Socialism, Utopian and Scientific, which I know we've had a podcast on, mm-hmm. which again is a fantastic insight into Marx's dialectics, materialist, and just really, it's quite an easy read really, I think, and people should try and read it. Well, it's big ideas, but it's a you know, yeah. very clear introduction yeah. to those big ideas, it takes a bit of time. Yeah, exactly. But it's not long. No, 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 exactly. And he didn't just delve into theoretical stuff. In 1872... He wrote a book, a small document, called The Housing Question. It was really dealing with some of the questions we have today about do socialists fight for just reforms or do we fight for a complete change in how we approach social questions? And that's, it's in an argument, really, of a guy called Proudhon, Again, an idealist thinker of the time. Well, sort of the father of anarchism, wasn't yeah, he? Yeah, yeah. Quite important. Marx did take some ideas from Proudhon when he was younger, but then rejected a lot of what Proudhon later came out with as well. Yeah, exactly. Again, that's the, again they learned the best bits and then took them and applied a dialectical approach, really. Yes, yeah, so the housing question, which, again, I think you can have a podcast on. Mm-hmm. I mean, look at the housing crisis we have in Britain, around the world. Yeah. The question of how socialists approach housing, what do we fight for, what sort of world do we want to live in, how would we approach housing the socialists, it's really important. And again, another one, a fantastic one, which again, it's hard to think that you wrote it in 1884, but the origin of the family, private property 
and the state really laid out the basis of a max explanation of women's oppression and how to fight it. And today is just as relevant as it is then. And again, you read it and you think, this guy was right in 1884 and he understands, and actually quite groundbreaking really, mm. to write about actually how sexism, the oppression of women, wasn't a natural thing. It was a product of development of commodities and so on. So I think for anyone interested in those ideas, another fantastic book that delves into that. And again, groundbreaking, really. Yeah, I mean, we should also say, by the way, that the origin of the family private property in the state, some of the points in it were based on ideas and scientific discoveries which had been made at the time, which have been superseded, actually, by new science since. But the basic ideas which they're laying out still obtain, still hold true, even if some of the specific points about some of the discoveries have subsequently... Oh, yeah, and I think that applies to a lot of Engels' stuff as well. Uh, I mean, so often he gets misquoted and quotes taken out of context... But again, Max and Engels were writing 150 years ago. Think of all the discoveries that we have since then. Mm. But again, Marxism has never sought to be a dogma, Mm. word-for-word dogma. It's a method, approach to thinking, an approach to analysis, an approach to how to apply a programme to a certain situation. So is that perhaps the key idea which socialists could take today from Engels and his life? Just lastly, I mean, after Marx's death, he helped really piece together all the ramblings of Marx on different pieces of paper and then went on to publish Capital Volume 2 and 3, played a massive role in that. But I think, yes, you're right. I think what we can learn from Engels is that despite his background, he threw himself into the working class. He didn't approach it from a top-down approach. We can learn a lot from how he approached working people, how he learned, observed, learned from them. And his approach... I've never sought to dictate, but to fight alongside... And again, fought to convince. I mean, sometimes you might read some of this and think he's quite aggressive, but he's aggressive to people that were their ideas and approach would be a mistake and would be a devastating blow to the working class if it was to go along that path. Mm. He never took that to the working class, to people he wanted to convince. He was a very sort of gentle, humorous guy that really rejected all the privileges he could have so quite easily rested upon. Mm. An amazing character, amazing human being, an amazing Marxist. <laughs> amazing socialist. I mean, we use the term Marx. I think Engels would not be bothered one bit that Marx's name has become the term we all use. He was happy to be part of that process, I think. I mean, it's a funny story, but I mean, at the time in the 1800s, a game often people would play is like your Ten Confessions. And there's one, it's, you can look on Marx's internet archive, and he got asked, like, what's your motto? And he says, take it easy. He wasn't that bothered if Marx had... <laughs> <laughs> it's great, it's a great quote. Take it easy. He wasn't that bothered, I think, Marx got all the... But he provided some of the groundbreaking thinking that Marx used. They were collaborators, they were friends, they were, they were comrades. And for today, we see around us the huge abundance of wealth. We see immense technological advances. Look, all, all, everything with iPhones, the things we do during COVID to communicate. All these th- leaps forward in science, in understanding what we know about the world. Robots. Robots, I mean... Who knows? I mean, when I was at school, we had one computer, and now like everyone's got one on the bottom of their hand. Yeah. All this gains, all this technological advancement. Yeah, actually, the way we live our lives hasn't changed much fundamentally. People working more, longer hours, and actually, often technology and the understanding that we have around the world is used now to exploit people more. It's not used to improve the lives of the mass of people globally. And as I said earlier. For large parts of the world, we have the conditions the same what Engels witnessed in Manchester. That's one of the key things we can take from Engels. That dialectic, the contradictions within capitalism, and also the understanding that it's only the working class that can change that. That it's going to be the working class through the struggles to defeat capitalism that can only be achieved with the leadership of a revolution party, which again, Marx and Engels set their lives fighting for. And only through the socialist change in society can we take all this understanding all this technology, all this knowledge and abundance of wealth and begin to reshape the world along socialist lines to make sure we have enough housing, we can defeat diseases and infections like COVID-19. Only through socialism can we begin to challenge all the horrors of capitalism. Um, sexism and Sexism, bigotry. homophobia, racism, mm. we've got starting with Black Lives Matter, all these horrors, social, political, economic... Marx and Engels understood that we had all these gains, but also the backwardness, the limits of capitalism, and only the working class has the power to change that. And really, Marx and Engels, their work, their lives were dedicated to that process. And for us, we can learn, we can read, but also be inspired by the struggles they took part in and learn the lessons from it as well. As always, if you like what you've heard, 
donate to help fund us, recommend us to your co-workers and friends, and if you agree, join the Socialist Party. Lenny, thank you very much. Cheers, James. Socialism is produced by the Socialist Party, the England and Wales section of the Committee for a Workers' International. Today we heard from Lenny Shale and I'm James Ivins. This episode was edited by Nick Hart. The socialist event of the year will be Socialism 2020. It's an open online forum of discussion and debate over four days, the 20th to the 23rd of November. Join hundreds of socialists, trade unionists and working class fighters to discuss the way forward in this extraordinary crisis of capitalism. Read more and book now at socialism2020.net. You can find further reading on this episode in the notes in your podcast app and at socialistparty.org.uk forward slash podcast. If you want to get in touch, email socialismpodcast at socialistparty.org.uk. Do you agree with the policies and actions the Socialist Party is fighting for? We need you. Send us your details at socialistparty.org.uk forward slash join. If you live outside England and Wales and want to join the fight for socialism in your country, contact the Committee for a Workers International by visiting socialistworld.net. Socialism, the podcast, has no wealthy backers. We rely only on funding from the working class, which maintains our political independence. So help us take the fight to big business. You can make a regular donation or a one-off payment at socialistparty.org.uk forward slash donate. Till next time, solidarity.